Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. The Jason Cabinet Experience is brought to you by Cabinet HR. At Cabinet HR, we deliver HR companies for 49 or fewer people. With our HR platform, it gives you access to HR Business Partner. Our guest today is Renee Reckless Declare. Renee, are you ready to be great today? I am. Thank you. Renee is president and CEO of TVW, Washington's national award winning public affairs media network. TVW provides unfiltered, unedited, gavel to gavel cable television and web streaming coverage, the Washington State Legislature, Supreme Court, Executive Branch, State Boards and Commissions, elections, and public policy events of statewide significance, as well as a variety of award winning produced programs and documentaries. Prior to joining TVW, Renee spent 14 years as a journalist, followed by four successful elections to the Washington State House of Representatives. While serving in the legislature, she got a number of prestigious awards and honors, including being named to the American Council of Young Political Leaders and is a fellow to the George Washington University Allet School of International Affairs. Renee, thanks for being here today. You have you've done a lot with the life so far. That's pretty good. Uh, thank you for that. So Renee, so TVW, is it a nonprofit profit? Is it like something like, you know, uh, PBS on, you know, public affairs TV? Like, what is the background on that? Uh, that's a great question uh, because TVW is different than public broadcasting television. And we're also different from what are called PEGs, which um, are funded through uh, your cable bill. TVW is different. We are a private nonprofit organization. Uh, for you tax attorneys in the audience, we are a 501c3. And we have a contract with the state of Washington to provide gavel to gavel coverage of all three branches of state government. And by gavel to gavel, I mean when a gavel bangs to start an event until it bangs to end the event, we don't edit, we don't provide editorial comment. We just give you the straight event coming straight from your state government. So Renee, is this a contract to renew every year or do you have to compete with other companies that do so, this? So uh, we did have to compete initially and now we have what's called a sole source agreement uh, with the Department of Enterprise Services within the state of Washington. So Renee, when you mean gavel to gavel, like it's supposed like some, we'll say congressman or representative goes, um, goes off the wall, starts cussing people out and it's does something crazy. That's, that's no editing at all, like everything's included. We don't edit anything. Um, and we've had some interesting things happen on the air. Uh, recently, because everything's been happening remotely, we had a guy uh, take a nice long bong hit uh, uh, during a committee hearing. So those kinds of things happen and we leave them because it is gavel to gavel coverage. Do you ever get any pressure from like any political party or you know lobbyists, whatever the case may be, like, I don't know, I don't use like word like censorship, like, you know, maybe don't play this or maybe play this a different angle or maybe do something different, you know? We do get that kind of pressure. However, because we have consistently applied our standard now for, uh, man, almost 27 years, it'll be 27 years next month, uh, people have come to expect that on, on our gavel to gavel coverage, we will not be editing at all. With our produced programming, that's a little different. Uh, but with our gavel to gavel work, we leave it exactly as it happened. So off subject, the guy who took the bonk hit, like, <laughs> right. what, I mean, what's the point? Like, that Washington State already has like pretty liberal like drug laws, right? So, what is he trying to prove? What is he trying so, to do? Uh, he was. Uh, he's actually a performance artist, and was just uh, trying to uh, kind of make a stir, I think. And so, of course, you know. A lot of stuff goes on government, a lot of policies, a lot of hearings, whatever. And those are you 24 7, 24 7, you know, how do you decide what to show, what not to show? So um, when we first got started, we could only cover two things at once. We're a cable television channel and we could show something live and record something for later uh, viewing. Now that we live stream, in addition to um, the work that we produce for television, we're able to cover everything. So everything that happens on the Capitol campus is recorded uh, and live streamed at the time it's happening and then archived for future use. So you're getting like new people in Congo or state representative, a new, new person, like some kind of board. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of train them like, you know, don't look at the camera, the, you know, don't over the camera, all that kind of stuff, you know, because like, you know, uh, I, I like to say like, and I've seen many extroverts become introverts when the camera pops out in front of them. You know, it's funny, uh, when TVW got started, I was actually in the legislature when the cameras were turned on. And the concern was, because, you know, politicians, that people would talk more uh, when the cameras were on them. And uh, there were some who were concerned that introverts would become more shy when the cameras turned on. 
at this point, people pretty much forget they're there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've gotten used to the C-SPAN model, people watching what their government is doing. And, and at this point, people are pretty comfortable with our cameras. Does anyone ever come to you like before and like expose us like director of some kind of board and they come to you, hey, Renee, you're like, how should I say this? Or like, do you get people like trying to like, for you, asking you to coach them or what to say, what not to say, how to perform better in the camera? You know, um, I can't recall that anybody's ever come to me for that kind of advice. I, I do teach classes periodically around, you know, how to present on television and that sort of thing. But, uh, but in, in this arena, I can't recall that anyone has ever asked me to coach them about how to appear on camera. As anyone said, Renee, I know you can't edit it. Oh man, I sounded horrible. I looked horrible. Please delete this. Um, we have had that happen. <laughs> and because we apply our standard uh, universally <laughs> uh, and very consistently, uh, they know we're not going to edit. So do other states have the same thing going on or is this like I guess only the Washington state? So um, there are many states who have similar kinds of uh, entities. We get together about once a year and we're all different. We're all set up differently. Our, our governance structure is different. Our funding mechanism is different. Uh, TVW is the only one that uh, is, a, is a fully private entity. There are others that are part of their university system. There are some that are part of their PBS system. Um, there are some that um, are connected to public radio, uh, but TVW is the only one that is an, an actual private nonprofit organization that then contracts with the state to do the work we do. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about ratings or ad spending, things like that, do you? Uh, we don't. We do sell uh, sponsorships for our programming, uh, particularly our produced shows. Uh, but it's really interesting uh, when you look at traditional television and then us, we've got all the airtime that we want. Uh, we don't have to worry about timing. We can uh, make things as short or as long as they need to be to tell the story. So when it comes to like, deciding who, to, like what to show on that show, does personality play anything in it? Like, you know, someone's like has really good personality outgoing, must say some Atlantic things, where someone else might like be kind of boring and, you know, you know, does that play a role or just... So uh, we, when we're working on our produced shows, we try to pick topics that are of um, great interest and significance at the time. Uh, for instance, we've done um, documentaries around the Asian giant hornet and around things like tsunami readiness, which has been a big issue this year. Um, and, and we really look at the issue rather than who we think is gonna be speaking about it. And once we've picked our issue and start doing the research around those kinds of projects, then we find the people who are the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it, or the ones who are really interested in moving legislation forward about it, or sometimes at state agencies, um, leadership of state agencies, sometimes someone from the governor's office, that sort of thing. So next, and you can agree or disagree with me if you want to, but Washington has like a reputation to be a liberal state, right? Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's not like really just Seattle area and Olympus liberal. The rest is like kind of you know, conservative or we case be. How hard is it to like, focus on things that cover the whole state versus this being focused on what Olympia and Seattle wants to hear? You know, uh, that's a great question. And we do find that the I-5 corridor tends to be uh, more liberal than uh, certainly the eastern side of the state. Uh, but we regularly pick topics that we know we're going to have opposing views. And we try to get then the viewpoints from all of those folks, not from our reporters, but from the people who are going to actually be making some of the decisions around those things. For instance, several years ago, we did a piece around the Yakima um, River water basin and how they were going to manage that water moving forward. And we heard from Democrats, we heard from Republicans, we heard from state agency folks, we heard from the organization that was mediating that conversation about their views on how it was eventually resolved. And we really tried to uh, connect all sides of the issue to the story without our overlay of our point of view and and you know we're human beings we all have uh, points of view um but the story is never about us it's about the people who are actually making the decisions and they need to be heard how often do you get press from either side saying hey renee um you you did like 95 percent of your programming leaning this way or 95 leaning this way and you just say hey we're doing the best we can. It's actually more even. And you, you know, um, that's happened one time that I can think of, and it was around that uh, Yakima Basin project. 
Uh, but most of the time we, uh, well, in fact, we do a daily show during the legislative session called Legislative Review, and we are very careful to provide the same amount of time to each side of the argument. And so people have gotten used to the way that we cover issues and the lens that we use um, to tr really try and share all sides of the story. And we don't hear that too often. That's great. So I'm a big believer everyone has some type of, some, some type of bias, either admit to it or they don't admit to it, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure you and your people right, you don't let your bias, or like, whatever that bias may be or may not be influenced what that you're is, doing? That is really a great question. Thanks for that, Jason. We talk regularly about the words that we're using um, and the pictures that we're showing uh, and whether or not they create um, a leaning one way or another. Um, as an example, mainstream media regularly uses the phrase tax loopholes. Well, those loopholes were designed by someone at some point. And so we tend to use words like tax exemptions rather than loophole because loophole creates an image in your head. And that's not our role to do that. If we're interviewing someone and they say tax loophole, we're going to leave that. But we're ne never going to say those kinds of uh, energy charged words ourselves. How does so? How many people do you have working for you? Uh, we have 27 right now. And are they pretty like they've been, they've been for a while? You have pretty constant turnovers. Like this working for you is like an intro level journalism job, or how does that work? Um, so most of our team are uh, production technicians and uh, they're teamsters, and they're the ones who manage the cameras. So our camera system on the Capitol campus, we've got about 70 cameras there now. Uh, they're all managed robotically from our from our building and uh, so the greatest number of our employees are those folks um, we do have on air uh, hosts and producers um, i would say not entry-level jobs um, one of our contract people is a very well-known npr uh, reporter who does the show with us uh, we work with another uh, Seattle area journalist who is now retired uh, from on-air work, but is very well known. Um, we have an on-air host producer who came to us from um, another state who covered uh, a variety of issues, but primarily government issues there. And then we have another person who came to us from Hawaii, where she covered um, news related to um, uh, the Filipino population there. So totally off topic. Yeah. But, but all your equipment, how often do you update your equipment? How often do you update the tech piece of what you do? So great question. Um, when I first landed at TVW in 2015, our mission was to completely rebuild our studio and we had to get the money for that first. Um, but that we were up and ready to go in 2016, in January of 2016, and we are now starting to refresh that equipment now. We typically say five to seven years uh, for equipment and we've been uh, rolling things uh, started rolling things probably about three to four years ago now. So Renee, you've been doing this for a while. What is like one political issue in the state of Washington that you're like, man, we had, why come we haven't fixed this yet? It always keeps coming back and back. Oh, that's, uh, I'm probably more than one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, transportation is a big, big deal here in Washington. Um, and it's kind of exacerbated by the topography of our state especially through Seattle, the city has built up around I-5. You've got two large, well, three large bodies of water, Puget Sound, Lake Union, and Lake Washington that really limit what can be done uh, to try and fix the issues through, um, through the I-5 corridor, really uh, the entire length of our state. And it's interesting because the I-5 corridor is a highway of international significance. And so that's a, a really big piece regularly. I think if you were to ask the governor what his big issue is, it's uh, obviously climate change and what the state is doing to mitigate that. Um, but I've been around state government in Washington for 30 years now, and we never stop dealing with the transportation issue. In addition to that I-5 corridor piece, um, our state ferry system is part of ours, considered part of our state highway system, um, and, and there are unique challenges that come with that, not to mention our state is split by a mountain range, and uh, we have interesting weather patterns that, uh, that challenge our roads and, 
uh, transportation is just a big, big deal here. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, the course, the construction everywhere. In Tacoma, someone took a picture, two pictures that looked the same, right? And then they added, well, this one was like for two years ago. And it's like the construction has been going on for two, two and a half years and nothing was changed, right? Like, this is crazy. And then I don't know if this is true or not, but I always heard like back in the late 60s, early 70s, some kind of referendum came down and people who could have voted like increased taxes for a little bit to like drastically improve transportation. But they were like, we'll never grow, grow as a state. No one will ever come, right? Yeah. And like, it's still like, if that's true, it's like we're still paying for that you know, short sightedness way back in the day, yeah, so if that was, is true. There was some federal funding back uh, in that time frame that the voters of Washington chose to turn down uh, that would have created a, um, a transit system very well. In fact, uh, the money went to the state of Georgia, which has a very uh, pro progressive uh, light rail system now and train system uh, that runs through Atlanta, Georgia. And that money could have come to Seattle, um, but we chose not to accept it. Through, yeah. a, through a voter referendum, we did that. If you could just go back in time, just choke all those people, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, next, talk about your time as a, as a journalist. Like, how does one become a journalist? You have to get a degree, you have to get to take some kind of certification, or you just pop up, my name is Renee, I'm a journalist. Yeah, so um, things have changed since I did it, and I came in kind of through the back door anyway. I um, got my undergraduate degree actually in anatomy and physiology and was planning to go to medical school, and I had to wait a year to get in. I started working for a newspaper, and that was the end of that. I've always loved to write since I was a little kid. And um, once I moved, I was in California when that was going on. Once I moved to Washington State, I was editor of a little business magazine up in Snohomish County and uh, through there got involved in politics and uh, the rest is kind of history. These days, just about anybody with uh, a cell phone um, who can string two sentences together and can take a picture uh, can have a blog. And uh, there are so many outlets for news and news related kinds of um, uh, publications now that really anybody uh, can do the work. Now, whether or not you could call them true journalists, that's questionable because once again, we're getting back to that concept of, uh, is this really the news that happened or is this my opinion about what happened? And quite often those, those blogs are more opinion uh, than fact, uh, but I think it's true that everybody's kind of getting into the game right now. So much from my age, but way back in the day, Walter Conkright would any of his newscasts were like, that, that's, that's, that's the day that was, or some yes. time for you, right? Yeah. And everyone, he could have said, the moon is made of blue cheese. Everyone would believe him, right? He had that credibility. Yeah. Now it's almost when, a, a, you know, someone from CNN, Fox News, Chad, and you would pick your, whatever it is, mm -hmm. when they talk, people automatically auto auto assume that either they're, you know, you know, bias, not telling the truth, or, you know, how do we get from like Walter Cronkite type of journalism that we're right now? Um, that's a great question. And I'm going to date myself now, but when I was a kid growing up, the newspaper was delivered about 3.30 every afternoon at our house and to the houses of our entire community. And we all read that same newspaper every night. And every night we all sat down to watch a half hour of local news and then usually a half an hour or an hour of national news. And it was Walter Cronkite or it was Huntley and Brinkley. And we all had the same uh, consumption experience of the news that we were taking in. In the mid to late seventies when cable television came along that exploded. And then again, in the 1990s with the internet, it exploded again. So we're getting back to that concept of anybody can call themselves a journalist at this point. And I think we really need to be honest about what the cable television model is. And you've got uh, MSNBC on one side and Fox News on the other side that are really more about delivering an audience to the people who want to speak to that audience, their advertisers, than they are about sharing true news. Um, they're sharing mostly opinion about the news um, and it's skewed either to the left or to the right. And uh, it's not a bad thing, it's just, we shouldn't really be calling it news. It's a business model to deliver an audience. Um, and that really changed uh, in the 1970s and early 80s with cable television and the proliferation of uh, the variety of channels that you could you could um, access. 
I remember like, I can't remember the newspapers, but someone took a picture of President Trump leaving a building. One paper said, basically said, this guy's the devil and he's taking us all hell. Other exact same pitch, other newspaper said, he's the best thing ever since sliced bread, right? right? And it was the same picture, same same subject. It was this craziness. And it's the opinion of the person writing the headline. So as far as um, journalism, it's not like a lot of people, they instead of like you know, going to the various political place, you know, media or, or different newspapers, or NBC, Fox, whatever, they go to the same place all the time or they go to the same Facebook friends, right? And instead of like opening their mind up and getting new possibilities or new ways of thinking, they keep on reemphasizing, reemphasizing what they think is the truth. Mm-hmm. How did is already get away from this, or is this is this always going to be for a while? Well, once again, their objective is not to share the news with you; it's to deliver an audience mm-hmm. to their advertisers, and and they're getting rich doing that. Uh, so that model is working for them. But I think we need to be cautious about calling that news. That's someone's opinion about what they see happening. It's not the news that you would get from Walter Cronkite or the news that you would get from Huntley and Brinkley back in the day. Is there a way to get break people out of this mindset? Like I said, most people like do the same thing over and over again, listen to the same. Is there a way? I mean, of course, you can't make a law saying you have to, you know, watch yeah. an evenly based, you know, unbiased whatever case you, people do what they want to do, but. It just seems like it's ruined, ruined the country in a way because they keep on like re-emphasizing and we keep on getting farther and farther away, you know? Well, it's been a, a huge factor in the, the uh, polarization that we've seen in this country over the course of the last 30 years, for sure. Uh, it's a part of that polarization. And, um, you know, I talked to friends of mine who've been in this business a lot longer than I have. And they say that the 60s were kind of like this. I don't really remember the 60s. But um, but once again, in those days, the proliferation of, of information sources bombarding us every minute of every day was not what it is today. So I don't really know how we change this, except to be honest about what uh, those organizations' uh, mission is. And to me, it's not new. Does... Is the way they teach journalism in school change any? Does that have anything to do with, or is, this, is this teaching method for journalism still the same? You, you? know, um, I, the uh, it's interesting because I I participate in a in a project over uh, with Washington State University every year around the Edward R Murrow College of Communication and their journalism school in particular, and they really are working to instill. Uh, that concept of um, honesty, integrity. It's not about you and your opinion. It's about the newspapers, or, or excuse me, the newsmakers and, and their opinions. Um, I really see that happening in, in that one school for, for certain. And I think it's happening in others. The challenge is when you have a 24 hour news cycle, seven days a week, um, and things, uh, you know, the sensational things make the headlines. You're constantly trying to build that sensation, and that's not what news should be. So obviously, we don't we want any we don't want any kind of like, you know national government you know news network or anything. But is there any kind of way we can like take the dependence on ad money away to make it less? I mean, I don't um, think we can, but I mean, yeah, that's uh, I'd never really thought of that, but I think that'd be challenging to do. Um, that, uh, that horse has left the barn, I think. Um, and you have some very successful entities, uh, building on that. And it's, you know, it's a free market. Um, yeah. people can put their money where they want to. Yeah. And also it's like recently, maybe going to like a little while where like all the news media companies started buying up other them, right? So now like it's NBC, ABC, these, all these things, actually one company, right? That couldn't have been a good thing, could it? Um, so uh, I, I'm a firm believer that competition is good and there's not a lot of competition anymore. Uh, you even look at the newspaper business and the big ones have purchased all the little ones and you see things like no matter where you are in the state, every, uh, every newspaper owned by one entity, the content is really all the same. And what people want when they pick up at their, their local newspaper is to see the high school basketball scores. Yeah. And what the weather is going to be in my neighborhood, and 
uh, who's winning the war, the awards at the local chamber of commerce and those kinds of things. And, and we've lost a lot of that uh, community newspaper kinds of um, local experiences that people are looking for. It, it still happens, but not to the extent that it used to. When I suppose someone is going to graduate this summer with a degree in journalism, what advice should you give to them? Should they try to get it up CNN, try to start their own blog? Like, what should they do? Um, my uh, encouragement to them would be to write and write and write and write and critique their own writing, get their friends to critique it, uh, look for uh, unintentional bias that may be shining through uh, in the words that you put on a page. Um, and then I would encourage them uh, to apply to a variety of kinds of mediums, uh, broadcast journalism. Uh, there are blogs out there that are, that are hiring lots of people to do their work. Uh, traditional newspapers, niche newspapers, uh, business journals all over the country are hiring. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there for kids who can write and, and companies for their own communications teams are hiring journalists these days. So there's lots of opportunities for kids who can write. I shouldn't call them kids, <laughs> yeah. um, but everybody's a kid to me. <laughs> <laughs> so Renee, you know, there's all these, you know, the CNN, NBC, all these organizations out there, you know, some lean left, some lean right, some lean like, like, like all, the, all the place. Do you have any recommendations on new sources that might be not might, might not be well known who actually give like an unbiased and as and, 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 and much they can a neutral take on everything? Well, of course, there's TVW. Yes, yes. And um, and C-SPAN is also a great resource um, for things that are happening at the federal level. And uh, I am a regular reader of Axios, and um, they print. Um, a blog several times a day that's that's very good. And um, I also read 1440 every morning, which is also very neutral. Um, and Axios is now doing a statewide reporting as well. So historically, they were just national news. They're opening um, state organizations, and they're coming here to Washington State very soon. In fact, um, a friend of mine's going to work for them. Um, so that's a, that's a great source for really straight news. Uh, and I think people are looking for those kinds of things. I, I definitely agree. So Renee, in your time as a, as a journalist, what are some things that have gotten better and some things that have like gotten, gotten worse? Well, um, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, one of the things that's gotten better is the technology to deliver content is so much easier now than it used to be. Uh, when I first got started in this business, we were still using wax pencils and, and you know, uh, pasting things up in the middle of the night. Um, that isn't a thing anymore. Um, in regard to broadcast journalism, the way we collect our content hasn't changed dramatically. The equipment's changing and it's more software driven than hardware driven these days. But the way we gather that content hasn't changed that much, but the way we push it out is so different. Um, our goal at TVW is to make certain that our content is available in ways that you want to consume it. So anytime, anywhere, any device. So there are streaming platforms like Roku and Prime TV, and we push it out through our own um, website, and we push it out through television. So people can view it on their time schedule when they want to and on the devices uh, they choose to consume it on. And, and so the ways in which we push it out used to be one mechanism, television. Now it's a million different ways. So Renee, I can't think of what it's called, but isn't a process where like, before you like publish something, you have to get like editorial review or some kind of peer review process? Um, no, um, for, for TVW, we do that internally pretty closely because of the nature of the work we do. Uh, but no, um, any sort of broadcast, particularly if we're talking web streaming, does not have to be peer reviewed. How about if it's like this, like a, a news article? You heard the time, like the New York, New York Times you retract this statement or whatever article. They get in a position where they have to retract because they haven't done the legwork up front sometimes. Um, peer review typically happens around... Um, scientific research mm -hmm. kinds of things. And uh, in this case, at, at least for TVW, we are not reviewed um, by anyone but our own internal staff who are 
keeping a pretty close eye on on our accuracy and as I mentioned before, the words that we use um, to uh, to tell a story. So now I think most people will say that, you know, most journalists, I, I think, I guess, 99.9% .9 of journalists have a degree. Mm -hmm. Is the degree really needed to be a successful journalist? Well, um, a lot of people are out there writing and publishing on the internet who don't have degrees. Um, and I think there are many folks who, like me, came out of a degree program that wasn't at all related to communications. Um, and I will just go back to what I said earlier. If you can write and communicate by speaking, you can do anything. And so the ability to communicate is really paramount. Renee, can you talk about the points of public speaking? I think, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I don't have to public speak. Oh, I have to sell my ideas. And of course, you no know, people are introverted or make it nervous. I think what was it say that people are more scared of public speaking than, than you know, actually than anything, like, else, than anything yeah. else, right? Yeah. Can you give you advice on people to get over that? Uh, you know, I've heard the old thing, just picture everybody naked. I've never been able to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, especially if I'm doing television or something, if I can just think of someone's face who I like talking with, whether that's my mother or, you know, one of my sisters or something like that, just think about somebody that I, that I want to share my story with and, and, and try to tell it to that person rather than to a crowd. Um, I tend to be a bit of an introvert, but when I get in front of a crowd, I kind of open up a little I, bit. I'm the, I'm the same way. And, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's hard for me to give advice to someone who fears a crowd because I know once I'm in front of them, I open up. Uh, it's hard for me to get in front of them. Uh, but once I'm there, uh, it gets a little easier. Yeah. I, I like to say I'm an introvert, introvert, right? Like if I don't like small talk, like someone comes to me and say, how's the weather? Like, I'm not, you know, are you, are you kidding me, right? But I like, I like talking in front of people. But it's really crazy. I said this before on the podcast. Every time I do, like someone comes on the podcast, like starting 20 minutes before it starts, I'll start, man, hope they don't come. <laughs> you know, hope they have traffic, you know, every single time, right? I get it. Like, damn it, um, she's here. I got to do this. Yeah, right. Shoot, shoot. Um, I'm terrible at parties. I hate uh, parties. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I, I avoid them like, uh, you know, COVID. Um, but uh, put me in front of 500 people and I'm okay. Uh, it's, that's, that's, it's weird, ain't it? People, yeah, don't, it people, don't, people don't understand that. Yeah, and they, they call us ambiverts. Yeah. We're, we're introverts, but yet we can do the other stuff mm. too. And uh, it's just, it's an interesting thing that goes on in our brains that makes us that way, I think. So any next, you served eight years in the Washington State uh, House of Representatives. And what, what, what a district do you represent? What location? So in those days, I was in the 21st Legislative District, which is uh, at that time was Southwest Snohomish County. So from the King Snohomish County line uh, and encompassing Woodway, the town of Woodway and Edmonds, uh, most of Mount Lake Terrace, Linwood and Muckleteo. So two part question. Why did you decide to run and why did you decide to not do that anymore? Um, well, the decision to run was harder than the decision to uh, to retire from public office. But um, I I was editor of a business magazine in Snohomish County, and uh, every episode of that magazine, I was writing editorials, my opinion, about what I thought was going on with state government. And people started calling me and saying, you know, you should look at running. You should run, you know. And I was hearing um, from one segment of the population who I discovered when I made that decision to run didn't live in my district, so they couldn't vote for me anyway. Um, uh, but they talked me into running and thankfully um, they were uh, generous in their giving to my campaign. Um, I've always had a bit of an affinity for government. Uh, I've always been interested in it. Uh, when I was just a child, um, my oldest sister decided she wanted to go to Washington, D.C. to finish her education. She was uh, going to be a junior in college. And my parents were very opposed to this because in reality, she was chasing a man and they didn't like him and they didn't support her chasing the man. And so they told her, OK, if you go back there, you got to stay until you're done. We can't afford to bring you home. I'm the youngest of five kids. She's the oldest. And they just said, you know, once you go back there, you have to stay. And uh, that was in September and November. My oldest brother was killed by a drunk driver and my sister couldn't come home. There was no way to bring her home. So my parents saved all of their money 
and rented a very ugly old turquoise um, station wagon. So, so this is a story on LinkedIn where you went there at seven years old, right? Yeah. Good. I, I, was, I, I was asking about this later. That's good. You're going to this now. I, I turned seven on that trip. And actually, um, my dad had made arrangements to do his professional development back uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as do some lobbying for his industry organization while we were there. And uh, the first day, the first full day we were in Washington, D.C., we went to the Capitol and sat in the gallery of the Senate and watched some of the activity that was taking place there. And I was so enthralled by all of that that I didn't get up to leave when the rest of my family got up to leave the gallery. And my dad finally noticed that I was not with them and came back and, and got me and but really recognized in me the interest that I had at that point. And so every day um, for the rest of that month, he took me back every day and we watched something, whether it was committee activity or the House or the Senate, he was doing some lobbying. He would take me with him to his meetings and I would just sit and listen and really just uh, became absolutely enthralled with the whole process as a little kid. So during your eight years, like, let me ask this. Can you talk about some of the, I think it's called the, the sausages of making Nick and legislation, like the, I want to say the ugliest, but like the sausage that everyone yeah. would just see, like. You know, uh, that's one of the beautiful things about TVW because you do get to see some of that, not all of it, uh, but you do see the public pieces of it. Um, things are far less um, sinister or, or maybe so, sort of uh, conspiratorial as people might think. Um, most of the debate on an issue you're going to see in the, in the public eye. Um, and then things happen like you run into somebody in a hallway and you say, you know, I'm concerned about this part of your bill. What if we did this? And it's those kinds of conversations that really spark um, the discussion and dialogue about what's going to be the best solution for the most citizens of our state. And it's fascinating to watch. Um, and, and the interesting thing about that is for the last two years, the legislature has been meeting remotely and those kinds of things have not been able to just sort of organically occur the way they traditionally have. And um, as someone who's been part of that process and, and now a long time observer of that process, um, we're missing that. Um, and we're missing it on a number of different levels. When you get to know someone like that, it's, it's, uh, it's far more difficult to vilify them um, and you know, speak ill of the other party just because someone's part of a different party. Um, it's just, it's really difficult to do that when you've had those kinds of experiences with people. So when you're there, do they call you former representative? Yeah. Do they, okay. Yeah, yeah. Most people just call me Renee. Me. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So back to making politics, and, and this is my opinion again, it's not like when like you have two sides and like they're going to negotiate over 10 things, right? One side gets down of them, right? Because they can't, can't get the 10th thing, they throw a tantrum or blow everything up to bits. And I'm like, you got nine things, take the victory and come back and find another day. But it's like so many people on both sides are like, no, I, I want all 10, I want everything or nothing. You know, um, I, I think it's getting more that way. And that's certainly, I, I worked for several years at the federal level, and it's certainly much more that way there than it is here. Um, I remember um, one of the elder statesmen when I was in the legislature having a conversation with him and talking about the value of getting half a loaf um, and taking that half a loaf and coming back, you know, the next year to try and get more or to make changes. And, you know, it's a, um, the sausage making, as you referred to earlier, is not a perfect um, process. And you're constantly making adjustments to things. Um, you try something, maybe pieces of it work and pieces of it don't. And so you come back a year or two later and try to fix the pieces that aren't working. Um, and for the most part at the state level, as we see at the local government level too, people really try to work together to make that happen. Uh, when I was in the legislature, um, I, I was with a different party than my seatmate in the House, but we worked together to try to do the right thing for our district. And I think there's more of that that happens at the state level than people realize. Serena, how much of a challenge is like, you know, a lot of people are short-sighted, you know, short memories, you know, let's do it now. And other people like, you know, long-term strategic people, how much does that play into it? 
Um, so the challenging thing about um, the House of Representatives at both the state and the federal level is you run for office every two years. And so if you want to show your worth, you got to get something done in two years. Um, that's very short-sighted in, in many cases. Um, Washington state has kind of taken the long view. And in fact, even though the legislature is writing budgets for a two-year period, um, the law now says that they have to project out what the bow wave is going to be over a four-year period of time. Um, so that uh, in the interest of doing a lot of things in a two-year period, we're not bankrupting the state over the course of a four-year period. So um, there are members who stay for many years and they tend to have uh, take sort of a longer um, view of the legislation that they're working on. The one thing I found is that um, there's really nothing new. The same issues come around and around and around and around. And it's fascinating to see how they're managed in one year and how they're managed then 10 years later. Is, is, is this a full-time job for people or they do a part-time, get part-time salaries? And like how, many, like how many days every two years have to meet, that, those kind of yeah, things? Yeah, so here in Washington State, it's considered a part-time job. It's, uh, it's difficult to have another job while you're doing it. I, I did, and a lot of people do because you know we're not independently wealthy, but um, uh, in odd numbered years, which is a full budget writing year for the state, they meet for 105 days. So that's just about a, a little less than four months. In even numbered years, like, like 2022, they just meet 60 days. That's a regular session. Um, they do go into special sessions periodically, but for five years now, uh, the legislature has just uh, stuck with their uh, regular sessions and they've been done in 105 or 60 days. So for TVW, do y'all like um, do like like a political debates, like like two, two people in office are doing a debate, y'all do those kind of things also? Um, we do. In fact, we partner with uh, the Washington State Debate Coalition. TVW is kind of the op operational heart of that organization uh, to produce debates of statewide significance uh, every election cycle. So in 2020, uh, at the height of the coronavirus uh, epidemic or pandemic, uh, we produced uh, a debate uh, between the gubernatorial candidates as well as the candidates who were running for lieutenant governor. Uh, this year, we partnered with the debate coalition to produce two debates around the Seattle mayoral election. Uh, this year, we're looking at um, two statewide white races. Um, there's a US Senate race happening this year there is um, a special election for the Office of Secretary of State this year. And we're also looking at potentially doing a congressional race uh, as well. So uh, we do do those kinds of things as well. So Renee, how did you do this? Like you're a representative and you, how did you do this? What's your advice for people in the in office now? Like obviously you gotta, you know, uh, represent your people, right? But how do you balance representing your people which what, which, which, what's for the greater good for the state? So, um, I always thought about things uh, in regard to what's the best solution for the state and what's the best solution for my people. And usually it was the same thing. And I always sort of thought uh, about my people, my, the people who lived in my district, the majority of them were kind enough to give me their vote, which means the majority of them thought that I most closely represented their point of view. And I, I took that very seriously. But I, I think for me, I, I was always kind of thinking about, you know, we've got to think about the state as a whole. And the two sides of our state are very different. Uh, it's even very different from uh, Seattle to Olympia and Seattle to Bellingham. Um, our, our state is very unique in that way. But, but you can think about things as it will relate to all of those people. And usually if I could come to something that I was comfortable with as being good for the entire state was usually good for my district too. Yeah, I, I might be making this up, but I wanna, I wanna say I remember like JFK before he's president, before, he's like a congressman or state representative. He was getting, he was getting slammed because oh, you're not doing what we want, you know, when you do this. And he was like, well, you elected me to be your representative. I'm gonna do the best of my ability and election time comes, you don't agree, you're gonna kick me out. You know, um, we live in a democratic republic, which is a beautiful thing. Um, it says that I will have a voice in my government 
through a person that I elect and send there. Now, that person who I elect to send there, I'm hoping that they're going to hear me and they're going to listen to me. Um, our Constitution gives every citizen a right to petition their government. And uh, part of our mission at TVW is making certain that people have the information they need to do that, but also the tools to know how to do that. Uh, one of the very big pieces of our program uh, is experiential learning opportunities for, for middle school and high school kids called Teach with TVW. And it's really about learning how to work effectively within our systems of government at all levels. So now obviously I haven't been in school for a long time, but you always hear, you know, on the news, different places, they're not teaching civics anymore. There's no more government classes. Is that actually true or is government still like a big part of school? So uh, here in Washington state, uh, students are required to have one half of one credit of civics before they graduate. Most school kids are getting more than that. And uh, we have uh, some classrooms who choose to use uh, our Teach with TVW programs as an after school kind of club experience, a civics club kind of experience. But we're finding that kids really have an interest in these things right now because of kind of the state our world is in. And, and um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. Our, our building is right across the street from the Capitol campus. And we see all these groups come through, you know, marching and chanting and, uh, you know, with signs and everything. And I, I know that makes people feel good to participate in those kinds of things. But the next morning when they wake up, what has really changed? Yeah. And the answer is nothing. So if they knew how to write a good letter or how to testify before a legislative committee or how to, during the interim, when the legislature's not in session, invite people out to look at their housing issues, to look at um, their business, and maybe look at some environmental concerns that they might have. If people really understood how to petition their government in the way that the Constitution gives us the ability to do so, uh, they would be far less frustrated um, with not only the folks who represent them personally, but the folks who represent all of our state. And what gets me, like everyone, when I say everyone, like 30% of the population votes in presidential election, right? Mm -hmm. But it comes times like there's local school board, city mayor, councilman, local locals, like maybe way, way down, right? And, and local has way more impact in, in everyday life, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, those local offices, really impact your day-to-day -day life so much more um, than what happens in Congress. Um, the bigger the office, the more noise they can, they can harness. Um, but if I were setting out today to tell somebody how to get involved in politics, I'd say, go to your school board meetings. If you've got kids in school, go to your school board meetings, hold them accountable to do what they say they're going to do. Go to your city council meetings, um, hear what they're saying, see if you agree with them. And if you don't, write them letters, invite them out to your business to take a look, invite them to your home to have coffee and to talk about the issue more in depth, or you know, go to the local coffee shop and have that conversation. Uh, these people are approachable and they need to hear from, from all of us. And, uh, and too often, we're too shy about making that uh, that outreach, and it's so important. Renee, how do we get like it's like the same people run for office over and over again? Like they they run for this office, they'll lose, run for another office, rinse and repeat. How do we influence more talented people to run? Of course, the thing is, if you run for office, you know you know Jason Cabinet is running for Mayor Dupont. While back in the sixth grade, he skipped school for two days and he did this, and you know like. You know, I've always said I'm glad I ran for office in the 90s before the internet was really a thing because uh, nobody's perfect. And uh, we've all got a skeleton or two in our closet. Um, but we need good people to run. And, uh, you know, I've been struck by the candor uh, which with, uh, with which a, a candidate uh, for the 8th Congressional District has dealt with his uh, his issues with alcohol this this year and i think given how everybody knows everybody's business the best way to deal with that is to own it yeah 
and uh, and let people know what you're doing to deal with it. And the more you try to hide something, uh, the more it's going to hurt you. And and I just think uh, candor and honesty says a lot about the integrity of a candidate. Like I know this would never happen. Actually, I think this would make, this would make a good comedy skit. Like there's a new conference and the news reporter says, hey, you know, Senator John Brown, blah, blah, blah. And the senator goes back, well, did you know your wife was, you know, messing around with your yeah. best friend, you know, like, like, yeah, like throwing it back, and, back forth. and forth. I mean, yeah. I know that never happened, you know, I think make make a great comedy kind of, skit. That would be kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Have you called Saturday Night Live? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so from your time as a representative, what's one thing like you're really proud of that you accomplished? And one thing, if you go back in time and like, man, I, I didn't do this right, or maybe I could go back and do this over, or maybe something you didn't finish, so to speak. Um, you know, I ran uh, because I got involved in a transportation issue that was really important to me. It was it, it was a deadly intersection. It was the only way to our house. And I got involved with the local group who was working on that issue. And we finally discovered that the only way we were going to get it resolved was to get somebody elected first. And so I ended up running and uh, I was pregnant with my son when this project started. Um, we actually got the project funded in 2000. I retired from the legislature and the project was finished in 2006. Um, that one thing has saved a lot of lives. It, it, I raised a child in the same amount of time. That was an 18 year span of time, um, but it has saved a lot of lives. I uh, was very involved in a variety of uh, prison issues for some unknown reason. When I got elected, I got assigned to the Criminal Justice and Corrections Committee and ended up um, being very involved in educational issues um, related to inmates, uh, as well as the safety of correctional officers who were working in, in that system. And I'm pretty proud of the, some of the work we did in that regard as well. Um, I, I also spent a lot of time in education issues, both K-12 and higher education, and uh, was a very big part of what is now known as the GEP program, the Guaranteed Education Tuition Program. Uh, that our state has, um, and, and that's a pretty big deal because that program is still going strong. So Renee, what's your opinion on this? So you have, the, of course, the people who get elected to government, do you have the you know, quote unquote bureaucrats who work there forever and make the day-to-day -day stuff go, and you have the lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Who act, So out of those, who actually has the most influence on what gets done? Oh, uh, the code no. reviser. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, boy, you know, uh, the people with uh, the longest institutional memory, I would say, have have not the most power, but but they're they're the people that everyone seeks out to get the history around an issue. And there are some lobbyists who have been um, working not only around the halls of Olympia but the halls of Washington D.C. for well over fifty years. Um, there are also some staffers who've been there that long. Uh, and I have nothing but the highest regard for legislative staff and, and congressional staff. Um, these people work really hard and they're really smart uh, and they know when to keep their mouth shut. And, and that is a gift. Um, most elected folks don't know that. Um, Ultimately, it takes a, an elected member to write a bill and to get it passed. Uh, but it takes all of those people to really get it done. So when you're elected, you, you have staff assigned to you and these people, you don't, you, you don't really know them or know their background or know their, their what's the word looking for? What drives them every day? You know? um, so your, your personal staff, uh, you have some decision making in their hiring. Um, but really, you work mostly with committee staff, and, and I made a joke about the code revisor. You work with the code revisor staff uh, to get the language uh, to fit in our current law and that sort of thing. Um, committee staff are nonpartisan, meaning that they don't, um, they, they don't identify with either the Democratic or the Republican parties. Um, of course, they are human. They have points of view, um, but for the most part, um, those nonpartisan staff members serve each member and uh, do it with confidentiality um, and really do what the member asks them to accomplish. 
Um, then the caucuses, there are four caucuses, um, they all hire their own committee staff too, or their own partisan staff that will help you put a partisan spin on the work that you're doing if you choose to do that. So Renee, if someone won't get involved in politics, like I won't get involved, but I don't want to run for office. I just want to like, you know, get involved at the local level and, you know, make a difference. What, what should they do? Uh, reach out to people, talk to your school board members, talk to your city council members, talk to your mayor, go to city council meetings, show up, show up, pay attention, uh, tell the truth and uh, see what you can do. So we have two parties in the U.S., Republican and Democrat. A lot of people will say we need more than two because they can never agree whatever. But I would argue, and again, agree or disagree, I would argue you already have four. You have the four left liberal Democrat. We'll call them the regular Democrat, the regular Republican, and then the far right, you know, conservative Republican. So that's just, we have four parties right now, right? Well, so you know, you can of, look at it that way for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see any new? We also have libertarians in the Green Party. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Actually, so we do have four parties. <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. Yes. Do you see any new parties coming along anytime soon? Or we, is we have what we have. You know, there is a, a movement underfoot, um, and this would be an interesting interview with you because uh, Washington State's former um, uh, executive director of the Republican Party, Chris Vance, is really leading this effort in our state. Uh, there is an effort to. Um, kind of pull those moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats together who don't feel like they, they fit with the extremes of their parties uh, to create a third party. I think that's a, a tough road. Um, and I've worked uh, with some other governments, uh, primarily in Greece and Ireland that have seven to eight to 10 parties. Uh, it's pretty chaotic. Yeah. Um, and do you really want, you know, the, the party that wins that only get 22% of the vote, you know, yeah. like, do, do you really want that? Uh, I don't think I, yeah. you do. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know so much about that, but I, I just think, uh, you know, our system is pretty entrenched now and with two parties. And when it works, it works really well. And I remember when I was in the legislature, some of the best work we did we, in the House, we could get 98 votes for that stuff and, and no nays. And, and that was usually some pretty good work. And uh, uh, and that's when it's fun too. Yeah, I think the last time I can remember there was like a third party might come apart when Ross Perot ran for president. Yes, and that's yeah. the last time I was like, oh man, this actually yeah. might be a third party. Yeah. yeah, well, and he did take enough votes from um, from George Bush, George H. W. Bush, to give it to Clinton to, to actually to swing Clinton. that yeah. that election to Clinton. And and I, I really expected to see that trend continue as well. Uh, we have an interesting situation here in Washington this year. We have a special election for um, the Office of Secretary of State. Um, yeah, because Kim Wyman got appointed to something by President Biden, I think. Yes, uh, she's now working uh, within the Department of Homeland Security around election security. And um, Governor Inslee appointed a Democrat to her seat. Uh, she was a Republican. It's kind of interesting. President Biden, because a Democrat, appointed a Republican to, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, and, and the interesting thing is there is a candidate in that race who is running as a nonpartisan. Um, she's presently the Pierce County auditor, and now she's running as a nonpartisan for that race. So here's one for you. So back in the day, um, President, President Bush was governor of Texas, right? So he got elected the governor of Texas, and the lieutenant governor was named Lieutenant Governor Bullock, right? And they were like fun enemies, right? They, they, they hated each other. They didn't agree. By the end of the day, they were best friends. Huh. And either Bullock went to, yeah, George, President Bush was Bullock's best man at his wedding. Oh, really? Yeah. So any stories like that from, from Washington politics that you know, like people started enemies and at the end of the day, they got along and, you know, agreed to disagree, so to speak. Uh, you know, I, um, it, it, I'll tell two quick stories. One of my best friends from my legislative experience is from the other party. And, uh, and he had been there for many years and, uh, and we became good friends and he was just a tremendous mentor to me, even though we weren't of the same party. And, and we're still friends to this day. Um, and I love the story of um, a Republican from rural Snohomish County and a Democrat from the Central District of Seattle who became very good friends and they both spent time in the other one's district 
figuring it out and seeing what the other one was dealing with and why they took, were taking the positions that they did um, based on the experience in their districts. And um, when, when the first guy of that partnership retired, um, they told beautiful stories about how they had just shared time with each other to see what the other one was dealing with. And, you know, if you, it, it's an amazing thing. When you sit down for a meal with people, when you spend time, you know, it, it's, an, it's an old proverb, but, you know, walking in their shoes, you get a better understanding of who they are. And those two became very, very good friends, even though personally and politically, they could not have been more different but they were willing to listen, to understand, and it made a difference. And, and I think those kinds of things happen all the time at the state legislative level when you really spend the time to get to know someone. So Renee, this next question, you might, you might not answer, but you know, you'll, you'll see on CPAN, you like two people from each party debating, right? Yeah. They're disagreeing. Yeah. And you always hear that one person like, you know, to my esteem and honored, you know, blah, yeah, right. blah, blah. Do they really mean this jackass is yeah. like just a jackass, you know? Um, so um, the rules are different at the state level and at the federal level. But I think it's but, called decorum, right? Uh, yes. And, and there are rules against impugning the motives of anyone, whether it's, uh, it's your colleague across the aisle or whether it's someone across the rotunda in the other body or whether it's uh, an interest group that's trying to get something passed. You just don't impugn the motives of other people. And uh, it's, it's not this way in the Senate, but in the House, you can't even call people by their name. So you have to say the good gentleman from the 43rd district or the, um, the kind lady from the 21st district. And the regular public, like, we know damn well, yeah. that's not what he means. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes that's the case, but most of the time we do like each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So next, let's switch to some of your volunteering things. And you do a lot of volunteering. But I was going to focus on uh, American Electronics Association and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, so I actually worked for both of those organizations. Um, and the American Electronics Association was an industry association for technology uh, companies. And um, out of that experience, I got uh, recruited away to work for Apple. So, And I wasn't at the AEA, the American Electronics Association, very long, but it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. And I, and I worked for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, too. I was out here in Washington State, though, and managed congressional and public affairs in six uh, northwestern states. And so this one's I didn't know. So, like, you know, you have, like, the local Chamber of Commerce, right? Mm -hmm. I always thought, like, the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce, Seattle Tony Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Kent, I always thought they were, like, fall under the, the Department of Commerce. Like, I had no idea that, like, like almost like nonprofits, yeah, local organizations. They, they are nonprofit organizations that, um, that serve. Uh, a common industry. And, and in the uh, case of chambers of commerce, it's businesses. So if you're, if you own and operate a, a legitimate business, you can join the local chamber of commerce. And how long were you at Apple? Uh, I was at Apple twice. Um, and the first time was about a year and a half. And the second time was five years. And what, what did you do there? Uh, so uh, <laughs> Apple doesn't have the, lobbyists. The, 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 you can tell. Yeah, Apple doesn't have lobbyists, but I lobbied for them in 15 Western states. <laughs> nice. So they yeah. have a pretty good experience working with them. Um, uh, I loved the work. Uh, it's a it's a challenging place to work. Uh, I, can, I can imagine. Yeah, the environment is just different. Yeah, it's not their their, their standards of excellence or nothing else. So it's seen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I worked really hard there and uh, really did burn out and yeah. I was hired to manage two states ended up in 15 and oh, yeah, wow. yeah so but it was a good experience nice so next um March 14th and March 20th there was a something called sunshine yes is that an every year occurrence yes um there's a national organization that put together sunshine week uh to really highlight um sunshine letting sunshine into government and government transparency and like open, open government, government open transparency government, exactly right and uh so every year tvw tries to highlight our work and uh this year we were able to uh place uh op-eds in in three papers around the state and as we were talking about earlier um papers are not owned locally anymore so when it was the McClatchy paper who ran it, all the other McClatchy papers linked to it, even though it didn't appear in their print editions. 
the same thing happened with our sound publishing uh, friends. Uh, and then we had a shared op-ed with the Washington State Debate Coalition in the Seattle Times. Plus, I did a lot of radio interviews, so it was kind of fun. And how many years has this been going on? I, you know, I wish I could tell you, but I think I want to say close to 20. 20 years. That's yeah, pretty good. Yeah. And then culminating that week um, here in Washington State, we have the Washington Coalition for Open Government. Uh, they held their awards event on Friday morning down at T-Mobile Park uh, to celebrate that. So that was kind of fun. And you too. said all, pretty much all, all the states do this in a certain um, kind of so way? It, so it is state uh, or it is na a national thing. I don't know how many states really celebrate it that much, but certainly here in Washington, we do. It's the same week for same all week, states yeah. every year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did you like coordinate anything with other states or just focus on state of we Washington? We did not. We okay. just focused on Washington. And for next year, how can people get involved with this? Pay attention. <laughs> it's always the same week in March. Uh, I want to say it's uh, the second week of March, second or third week, but I think it's the second week of March. And uh, and I always write op-eds for it. So you'll see those um, in papers around the state. Uh, like I said, we do radio interviews uh, at TVW uh, with our produced shows, our weekly shows. We focus on uh, government transparency and openness. Uh, this year in one of our flagship shows called Inside Olympia, we interviewed Essex Porter, who has just retired from being the government reporter from Cairo 7. I, I remember um, that. I yeah, remember, yeah, I remember yeah. he was, I remember the TV show, he's like, yes, you know, they get yeah. his party retiring, I remember that. Yeah, he, uh, he just recently retired and he's been covering government activities in Washington State for many, many years. So we interviewed him, it was kind of fun. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just an opportunity to really highlight uh, how transparent and open our governments are. So Renee, what do you do for yourself to keep your journalistic chops up to speed, so to speak? You well, know? I, I still write quite a bit. Um, you know, we're constantly writing scripts and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I do a little bit of that. Um, I do a lot of, uh, like I said, I write op-eds periodically for newspapers. Um, I, my focus at TVW is is kind of across the board. So I'm constantly writing grant language and um, and uh, verbiage for fundraising efforts and that sort of thing. Because even though we've got a contract with the state, about 85% of our annual operating expenses comes through our private fundraising efforts. So we spend a lot of time raising money. Renee, are there any journalists that you follow? Um, so I really loved Robert Mack when he was still working here in Washington, and he now does a little bit of work for TVW, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, as, as a local journalist, uh, I always valued his work. Um, I, boy, who do I really follow? Like I said, I read Axios uh, three times a day, and, uh, and I really like their work. I think they are um, just very straight story storytellers. And they do it in a fairly quick fashion, which I like. I also read 1440 for the same reason. And they have a variety of writers, but that's where I tend to get my, the most of my news these days. So next we're gonna go over some, so I, I Googled um, top issues in the state of Washington, right? Mm -hmm. so, come, so we'll just go to some of them. Oh, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, so one of them is um, long-term long, long -term care of the aging population. Yes, yeah, that was a big deal. A couple of years ago, um, the legislature uh, passed a long-term care uh, strategy. I mean, we all hope our kids are going to take care of us, right? But, right. but in reality, like, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, it, it, they did an interesting thing. All insurance plans are based on risk. This one, however, you're, the premiums that you would pay to the state, not to an insurance company, was based on income rather than risk. Um, and the funds realized from it are not enough to even cover a year in a care facility. So there was a lot of concern about uh, what the final outcome would be. And so the legislature this year in 2022 postponed it um, to have the payroll deductions happen in uh, July of 2023 with care um, to, to be able to commence in, I believe, January of 2026. And they did that because so many people, almost 500,000 people, uh, chose to opt out of that program. So you could do that. And when they realized how many people were choosing to opt out of it, they realized they needed to go back and do some fixing. Yeah, I want to say I remember a story where this couple, elderly couple living in the Holiday Inn, and like, well, you live in the Holiday Inn, and they broke down the math, you know, because, you know, you get 
free room service, free all this, that, mm -hmm. and, you know, free breakfast. And it was like way cheaper than, you know, cheaper. being in a nursing home. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard of people doing that or yeah. doing like the, of course, have to have more money, like, like living year long on the cruise ship, you know. Yeah, I've heard that one too. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so next uh, big one is education. Education is always big. Yeah. So with that is that, now, of course, the stats say, you know, since the 70s, the cost has increased by 10 million percent. You know, the salaries have stayed the same. Is, is, is college even worth it? Some people say, well, college is not to get you find, to help you find a job. It's like build a social network. So all that plays into it, too, I think. It, yeah, it does. And and certainly on the on the higher education front, there are lots of education opportunities that don't. Um, become a four-year degree. Uh, we need people who can do anything, and uh, we need people to go to trade schools. Um, we need plumbers. We need carpenters. We need electricians, and uh, those kinds of uh, journeyman programs are great, uh, and those are, are great paying jobs and don't require a four-year degree. Um, Washington's budget now um, is right around $60 billion. And more than 50% of that goes toward education. Yeah, I think not in the state of Washington, across the nation, it, it, it don't matter what your industry is, like you'd be a tech worker, trucker, plumber, yeah. you know, food staff waiter, bartender, everything's like way, way short as far as labor is. Yeah, uh, right now, labor in almost every industry is really um, is really struggling. Um, I can't remember who I was just talking to, but it was an industry that I hadn't anticipated would have a, a labor shortage. But when you look at the, um, the supply chain issues that we're having coupled with the labor shortages, particularly in the ag industries, which Washington State is so dependent on those, uh, it's, it's painful right now. One thing I don't think a lot of people realize how diverse the Washington State economy is, right? Of course, you have you have Starbucks, Boeing, you know, you have Trident Seafoods, Fish. I think every industry is represented yeah. in a big way in the state of Washington. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got aerospace, you've got software, you've got ag, um, and it's not just ag in eastern Washington. When you look at other, uh, you look at the Skagit Valley and you look at Whatcom County and those areas, they're very dependent on ag, too. Washington is really quite diverse, and I would say that's one of the reasons our economy has remained relatively stable. Um, but right now, when we're facing the kinds of supply chain issues that we are, it's pretty tough to build an airplane. It's pretty tough to get the help that you need and the kind of um, uh, intellectual expertise uh, you need to keep advancing software. And it's pretty tough to get the labor that you need uh, to pick the cherries and it's just it's challenging across the board right now yeah we, we haven't talked about the chip shortages you know yes, you know all yeah, that kind of stuff yeah. I mean, chips are short because yeah. we can't make cars it's, and then with covid and of course the war in ukraine it, it really highlights how globalized we were and how yes. how it's like it's almost like what's it called a uh, same day delivery logistics you know it's not same day literally yeah, anymore. It, it was yeah called just in time just in time yeah, just in we, time. we did everything just in time and and we just can't rely on that anymore uh, you asked earlier about uh, refreshing our equipment, and we're just in, a, it's an annual process. We refresh some things every year, and and we're just in the process of going through that now. And my uh, chief engineer and my head IT guy are tearing their hair out because you order something and you can't get it, um, and you have to wait months and months and months to get it. And in the meantime, our equipment is is aging and starting to fail. And it's, uh, it's just a challenge right now. I remember my, my daughter and her husband, like maybe a year ago, ordered some furniture and they said it would come in like eight months later. Wow. Like, yeah. 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 It's craziness. So next, um, we talk about some of our housing, mm -hmm. like I think called single zone housing. Mm -hmm. Of course, like I said, there's a, there's a housing shortage everywhere, especially it's worse in the Seattle area or state of Washington because it's just, you know, some people say the tech people price us out, you know, there's all these theories and stuff going on. Well, um, many years ago in the late 1980s, uh, Washington State adopted a Growth Management Act that really uh, laid out the plan for how communities would grow. And they tried to keep populations into a very tight urban core area so that there would not be the kind of sprawl that we were experiencing at the time in, into rural areas. Um, 
there's a challenge with that in that land is in limited supply and we're not making any more of it. Um, so you get people uh, very closely um, connected in urban cores, there's more people in a smaller amount of space, we become like rats and start eating each other. If you ever saw the movie Ben, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what happens, or, or Will, Willard, I think was the other one. Um, but uh, it, it, the cost of housing is driven by a number of different factors. One of them is there is a limited supply of land. The other one is we keep adding regulation upon regulation upon regulation to home builders so that when they build a home, all of those costs ultimately get um, uh, shifted to the home buyer. And every time you raise the cost of a home, you're pricing somebody out of that market. Um, so there are several things going on there with uh, the cost of housing. When people can come in and pay you know, hundreds of thousand dollars over asking price with cash, that's also a problem that drives the cost too. Yeah. And when you talk about the tech sector, that's kind of what's been going on there. Um, so it's just, it's a combination of things. Yeah. That is the thing on 60 minutes last weekend where these large corporations go, go, go in and buying houses, like hundreds of thousands of the asking part. And now instead of the home being someone's home, they're renting it out. Oh, interesting. To their employees? No, just any, any just person. Yeah, there's like three or four yeah. big corporations in the United States and Canada. They like buy up whole neighborhoods, you know, cash offers, hmm. and they take it, refurbish it, put new stuff in, and they, you know, rent it out to people. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. We definitely have a homelessness problem here. And, and it's, uh, there are a lot of things going on and nobody's situation is the same as their neighbors, but um it, and the pandemic has exacerbated this, but there are drug issues, there are mental health issues, there are all sorts of things tied up into the ish, uh, the issues around. And sometimes right it seems like the more money we throw at it, the worse it gets. It seems like sometimes I mean, I, I, it that's seems the that optics. Way. That's what like, yeah. optics, especially with downtown yeah. Seattle. Like nowadays, yeah. like there's killings all over the place. You walk yeah. down a Third Avenue, you know, just yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So so next. Um, Talk about uh, Governor Easley's like big, big thing, climate. Climate. So is climate really that big of a deal? Or is that something he's just pushing because it's personal agenda? I know some people say, you know, it's a cycle that happens, you know, every thousand years. It's you know, all this kind of mumbo jumbo yeah. and science is not like what you take on that. Um, so I'm not a climate, a climate scientist, obviously. I, I do know that this is an issue that the governor has cared about uh, for many years. I mean, and actually ran for president on this one yes, issue, right? and long before he was governor, when he was a member of Congress, this was an issue that he cared passionately mm -hmm. about. Uh, so I think he's being truly authentic yeah, in, yeah, definitely. in continuing uh, to try and work on the issue. Um, like any issue, it's far more complex than you would think. And when you think about the actual land mass of Washington compared to the rest of the world, um, you wonder how much policy changes here will actually change the global picture, especially when you look at uh, a, a country like China, which a lot of um, their air particulate actually ends up in Washington state, thanks to you know wind patterns mm -hmm. and things like that and the airstream uh, movement. Um, so you know, I, I appreciate his passion around the issue, um, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard issue to try and deal with, and yet, uh, it has to start somewhere. Yeah, he probably has the philosophy. Like, I, I'm sure you hear the story where, like, a kid and his grandfather walking down the beach, and all these starfish on the beach. He starts throwing one by right. one. What are you doing that makes a difference? Well, it makes a difference when starfish. Yeah. That's probably his yeah. his mindset. Yeah, or some along those lines. So, what's your take on on voter ID laws? Um, so we have a myth uh, in this country right now that uh, our elections are not secure when in fact our elections are Very quite secure. secure. And uh, I don't have a problem with people identifying who they are when they go to the polls to vote here in Washington state for the last 10 and maybe 11 years now, we've been voting by mail. Um, and there are security systems in place to ensure that uh, the person who says they're voting is in fact the one who's doing the voting. Um, so uh, I think, I think, the issue is not as big as maybe um, we've been made to believe. 
Yeah, I, I did 25 years in the Army. I voted every election through the mayor, right? Mm -hmm. So when one party says, you know, mailing is not right, I'm thinking, right, you know, so you're saying you want to disenfranchise this whole veteran population because that's how in the military you vote, right? Yeah, right. Okay, because you're stationed yeah. in Germany or Korea yeah. or whatever case, but you can't like hop a plane and come vote in person, right? Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, reward IDs, like, do you want anyone that's coming to the poll and say, here, I'm Jason Cabinet, so, like, no proof who they are, like, I don't know about that one either. Well, so when you, when we used to go to the polls, you had to identify who you are, you mm -hmm. signed the book, no one else could sign if you had already signed uh, in your space. And uh, if you ever get an opportunity to go to um, a, a processing center for elections it's fascinating to watch and they have republicans and democrats who watch that process uh their election monitors um it's really quite secure and uh and it's monitored and it's really quite impressive when you see it in person yeah but what some states are doing is like makes you scratch your head right because i'm from texas and they passed a law recently where like there's only one ballot box each county right really yeah and like, of course, Harris County with Houston, Texas, that's a pretty big county, right? Yeah. And so like one box for people called build a box of things like this doesn't make any sense, right? And then when people say this voter suppression, you're like, okay, they might be on to something because one ballot box in a county that's, I don't know. This doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem right to me either. But there's no, there's like really no national like voter law, right? Is it, it's all basically up not, to the state, it's up to each state. right now. It's up yeah, to each state, right? It's up to each state. Um, and actually here in Washington state, after you mail your ballot, you can track it. And you can log on to a site on the Secretary of State's website and see if your ballot's been received. You can see if it's, uh, they, do, they don't count them early, but you can see if it's been received and is being managed, so. And once you vote, like you mail your ballot, you can't say, oh man, I changed my mind and we vote right. Once you vote, you're voted right. Once, once you've voted, once That's you've uh, set that puppy in the mail, it's uh, it's done. It's done, yeah. I wonder how many people change their mind, you know, after cases like some of that come in the news, you know. I don't think it happens at all. You know, uh, sometimes this happens with scandals. Things will come out right mm. at the end of an election. And if you voted early. What's it called? The, the, the October surprise, November yes, surprise? October, like yeah, yeah, November surprise. Uh, if you vote early, because we do vote by mail here, as soon as you get your ballot, you can vote and send it back, which is what I tend to do. But I, I think most people make their decisions, uh, I, I hope that they make their decisions based on the policy positions that their candidate has taken during the course of the race. You remember this one? So when Gore and Bush were running like the day before election, like November 2nd, November 1st, it came out of Bush had like a DOI. Yes. I like like, that. like the day of yeah. the day before yeah. the election yeah. that was the year of the hanging chat yeah <laughs> yeah yes um so what are some issues or challenges you think are facing the state of washington well uh we already talked about transportation that's a big one um spending here right now is is really high um thanks to the pandemic Washington has a very large surplus of funds. Um, yeah, I read that article. Yeah. Where I got this from like the there's like like record level tax money came in or something. Yes, and uh, that we weren't expecting because of the pandemic. Uh, in addition, the federal government has sent a lot of money out to the states to try and help recovery efforts from the pandemic. And so Washington this year was really a wash in funds, and this is what they call a supplemental budget year. Uh, typically, they make small adjustments based on population changes and maybe caseload changes in um, in foster care and schools and, and those kinds of things. Uh, because there was so much money, the state re really made a lot of one-time investments in a variety of issues that are very needed. Um, but um, as an observer, my concern is we're going to get used to that level of spending and how do you pull it back? now uh, because that the level of spending we are at right now is absolutely not sustainable so anyway, back to the housing challenge right so for a long time the state i think seattle or there was like a, a moratorium something on rent where you can't charge people rent right and they, you can't kick them out during right? covid yes during covid yeah, yeah. But how about for the people who own the houses or own the homes? Was yeah. It, um, they just had to pay the mortgage and stuff. That was any relief for them? Uh, or? So there's talk right now, and I, and I apologize. I'm not real familiar with, with what's happening. And it's happening more at the local level than at the state level to try and provide some relief to those land owners, to those landlords who've been um, very gracious to tenants during 
of this time when some people lost their jobs and, and, uh, you know, we're working from home and that sort of thing. So I, I can't really speak to that, but I know there's some um, conversation around how to provide some relief to those landlords. So now you were talking about some, can you go to more detail about how TV, TVW got started? Sure. And then like what you're focused on now, what's your long-term vision for it? Yeah. Um, so uh, TVW was actually founded by two guys who worked for uh, former Governor Booth Gardner. Uh, Stan Marshburn was his legislative liaison, and uh, he had been at the Evergreen State College prior to uh, going to work for the governor's office. And he walked into the governor's chief of staff one day, and that just happens to be um, Denny Heck, who is now our lieutenant governor, was uh, Governor Booth Garner's chief of staff at the time. And he said, hey, you know what we should do after the governor retires and we're looking for work? We should start a Washington State C-SPAN. And C-SPAN at that point had been around for about 15 years, and uh, Stan just really had a vision for um, Washington citizens to be able to see what their government was doing. And so um, the governor retired at the beginning of 1993, and Stan and Denny went to work to try and convince the legislature uh, that their work needed to be uh, seen by the citizens of our state. Um, they raised money and they lobbied for a couple of years. And um, the very first lobbying visit I got after I got elected and before I even took office uh, was from two guys who came to see me about what they were then calling WashPan, uh, which is Washington Public Affairs Network. And I remember saying, you know, you got to change that name. <laughs> but um, uh, but they were they were promoting it like C-SPAN. And um, we talked at length about it. I was really attracted to the idea because I was a journalist. And um, the next year in 1995, uh, the legislature was in special session in October of 1995. And uh, you or your listeners may not remember this, but in 95, the Mariners were actually in the playoffs. It was a big year. And uh, the legislature was in special session coming up with the funding mechanism that eventually became Safeco Field and now is T-Mobile Park. Um, during that time, the House took the vote to turn the cameras on in House committee hearing rooms and on the House floor. And the very first debate we captured was the debate around that funding mechanism for a baseball stadium. Um, that was in October of 1995, uh, when the legislature came back into regular session in January of 1996. Um, House members got great press because TVW shares their content with anyone at no cost. So uh, both print media and broadcast media were picking up House members like crazy because they had this free content they could now use. And the Senate wasn't getting the same kind of attention. So when we were in special session in May of 1996, the Senate took a vote to uh, turn their cameras on in the regular session starting in January of 1997. So by 1997, um, all of um, uh, the legislature was being televised on television only. The interesting thing is uh, the very first thing we covered, our signal went live on April 10th of 1995, and the very first thing we covered was um, oral arguments before the state Supreme Court, and that was historic for a couple of different reasons. First, um, it was a death penalty case that had a lot of national attention. Um, but more importantly, and the thing that has really added to our legacy is Washington and TVW was the very first organization in the world that had ever embedded cameras in an appellate courtroom like a state Supreme Court. And whenever I say we were the first in the world, former Chief Justice Gary Alexander always uh, interrupts me and says, no, we were the first in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he takes great pride in his, the role that he took in um, making certain that uh, the work of the Supreme Court uh, was also highlighted um, in, in our coverage of state government. Uh, so when you ask about the future, and I mentioned uh, former Chief Justice Gary Alexander, TVW has just um, uh, seeded an endowment for our future. Um, as I mentioned, we have a contract with the state that accounts for about 15 to 18 percent of our annual uh, budget. We also raise money privately, philanthropic uh, funds. We also sell programming sponsorships and cobble together um, grants and uh, gifts from foundations and that sort of thing to keep us on the air. So, and looking at our long-term sustainability, the founding of this um, uh, endowment is very important. And we 
are naming it after former Chief Justice Gary Alexander for his role in, in our early days. Um, we have also outgrown our building. Uh, we moved into our building in 2006, uh, the Jeanette C. Hainer Media Center, uh, really just right across the street from the Capitol campus. That's a perfect location for us. And we are negotiating with our, our block partners um, to come up with a strategy for uh, expanding our footprint uh, on the block that we're on. So Renee, so any plans on like moving this, like taking this over for, for like the state of Oregon or Idaho or Alaska? Well, we talk about that all the time. And, uh, and Alaska has a wonderful public affairs network. Uh, and we work with Oregon a lot already. Um, they're covered by their public broadcasting system, Oregon Public Broadcasting. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, a company that TVW founded and which we have since spun off um, manages their web streaming for them, uh, for, the for the state of Oregon and many other states. So Renee, let's talk real fast about career politicians and, and term limits. And I, I, and I thought of this because you mentioned Danny Heck back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So me and my family moved to DuPont, Charles and I was the military. I remember the first time we seen give Congress Heck right. Yeah, and right. Now he's the so he's like, I always say, say he's a career politician. Mm -hmm. Are career politicians good for the government or are democracy republic, Republican or, or, or Republic or, you know, like, I used to be you know, against term limits, right? I still can. I am right. You know, we already have term limits, right? To vote people out, right? Exactly. But then it's like, you see the same people can vote in and vote in and vote in, right? But then you understand like, you know, like, you know, like this might be a bad example, but Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, like, how is he still in office, right? But he represents the people. Same go away with the guy in uh, West Virginia, uh, Senator Munchton, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. Most people see what it does, it doesn't do it. Like, how's he still in there? But he's representing his people. So how is it good? Is it bad? Is it like, is this a way the founders set up to have quote unquote career politicians? And I know that's a bad term to use, you know, but. Well, so our government, even our federal government was set up to be a part-time gig. And the assumption was you would come, you would do it for a while, you would go home, you would come back a year later, do it some more and go home and stay in really close touch with the people you were representing. Um, Today, once you've been in office, you have an opportunity to build really strong name rec recognition and people vote for the names they recognize, right? Um, and term limits uh, in Washington state where we had them at the state level for a short time um, were ruled unconstitutional because you can't tell someone who they can vote for. If I wanna vote for you, Jason, and you've been my state representative for 20 years and all of a sudden you're term limited out and you're not running anymore, I can still write in your name. And if I get 130,000 of my closest friends to also write in your name, you're gonna win, whether you're on the ballot or not. And so um, our state Supreme Court ruled that term limits were really unconstitutional because you can't tell someone who they can vote for. We talked a little bit ago about who has the power in our political uh, arena. And it's really the people who've been there the longest. And if you start telling members they can only serve three terms, which was what the term limit was here in Washington state, then you have staff and lobbyists who work for special interests, not the people who have elected them, but for special interests who really have the most power. So I am not a fan of term limits. However, I'm also not a fan of people who choose to stay in elected office for an entire career. I don't think that was the way our system was designed. Um, the complexities of um, our, our bureaucracies now, uh, the more you know, the more power you have and you know more by staying longer. And, uh, and so some people do choose to stay for a very long time. I believe in a citizen legislature. You come, you do it for a year, a few years, and then you go back uh, to your real life. Uh, but that's my philosophy and not that of TVW or anybody else. So I'm about to show how much of a history geek, geek I am. So back during the Roman, Roman days, the, that emperor named Cincinnati, he ruled, he retired, went to his farm, the country got invaded, the citizens called him back, he led the Republic again, they won. Like they called them back to serve like two years, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of like the, what we wanted now, right? You know, you serve your time, they need you, you call you back. So they loved him. They wanted him. They had the right to call him back. Yeah. You know, and it happened, and I've seen people run for office, retire, 
and a few years later come back. That happens. So you might not have an answer to this, but you know, everyone has like a cherry motto sometimes, right? Do you think most people get into politics and they think, okay, I'm gonna politics to make the change, and then, then they get in the system and kind of get jaded by the system, you know? So I've worked with uh, lots of legislators uh, in, in a number of different states over the years. And I've also worked with members of Congress. And, and I can honestly say, I've never worked with anyone who I thought wasn't in it for the right reasons. A Democrat, Republican, independent. And I've worked with some independents. Um, I, I think that their motivation is right. Now, whether or not I agree with them is an entirely different matter. We have different points of view. They represent a different population than I do. Um, but, but I think their heart's in the right place. Um, are there people who get into it for wrong reasons? Yes. And are there people who uh, stay there so long that they get jaded? Yes. Um, but I don't think that's the majority. And certainly at the state level, I don't think that's the majority because frankly, you're not going to get rich serving in the state legislature and and people just can't have that be their sole source of income for a very long time or you wouldn't be able to plan for your future yes uh, or for your children's future and and i just don't think uh you know you may have have uh, different policy agendas um th than an than another person but it doesn't mean that you're in it for the for bad reasons uh, I just really see that so rarely. Can you talk about this some? Um, so I think a lot of people think a Republican is a Republican, Democrat is a Democrat. But in reality, a Republican state of Washington is probably not a Republican in Texas. You know, a liberal yeah. Democrat in Texas is probably not a liberal, you know, yeah. Democrat in New York City. Yeah. Can you talk about how the, each location kind of changes the outlook of the, the, the party there? You know, it's funny. Um, I used to work a lot with um, Democrats in the state of Idaho who we would consider Republicans here in Washington state. You know, they were really pretty conservative. Um, it, the reality is there's a spectrum of political views and, and no one, um, people can fall anywhere along that spectrum. And on one issue, I may be, you know, fairly far to the right. And on another issue, I may be right in the middle or leaning to the left. Who knows? Um, it's a spectrum and people move within that spectrum. And there are Republicans who fall within, you know, the full range of their center right spectrum. And there are Democrats who fall within their center left to the very far left spectrum. And it's just on different issues, you find yourself in different places. And it's, we're humans. Um, we have different uh, ways of thinking about things based on our life experience. And that's the beautiful thing about the legislative process at all levels of government. We bring who we are to the table and it's our life experience. And uh, hopefully the, um, the experience of the people that you are representing uh, that leads you to take positions and care about the issues that you do. Yeah. It's a fascinating process. We're human, Yes, you know? Um, you don't fit into one camp no. all the time. Like, You're human. Like I know plenty of Republicans are pro-choice or you know pro LBTQ. I know plenty, plenty of Democrats like pro gun rights. You know. Yeah. But what thing that kills me, like you'll like you'll say, someone will say they're a Democrat, right? But then they'll put a hey, I'm pro gun. Oh, they'll get slammed, right? You're not really a Democrat. Well, so you're like uh, pro pro whatever mm -hmm. the different sides. This one issue, you like. It you, happens all the time, and and we're we're humans. We bring our life experience to the table, and uh, it's not easy to fit into a bucket, even though we choose buckets for ourselves in this state, uh, we choose how we want to run and or what party label we want to run, but, uh, and you look at the party that you think most closely aligns with your views, but you're not going to fall into that bucket every single time on every single issue. And if you did, that should probably scare you. I agree. That's, that's a good way of looking at it. Yes. And so I just saw this movie I watched a long time ago. Is that talking about name recognition? Mm -hmm. So it was an Eddie Murphy movie, and this guy had run for like was a comic for like maybe thirty years in a row, right? And he died, and his name I'm making this, his name was like you know Abraham Wilson. Mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy's name in there was Arnold Wilson. So I ran Eddie as A Wilson. Yeah. And so he got elected. Yeah. And it happens. Um, so 
the senior senator from the state of Alaska right now is uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski. Her father was senator before her, same name, Murkowski, and it's kind of a, a you know, not very common name. And uh, she's actually a better senator than he was, uh, but she's been there a very long time, but her dad was governor and then he was U.S. senator and now she's held the seat, uh, I want to say, since about 2000. It's almost like the family maybe. business. Yeah, uh, almost. Yeah. But that name has carried her. Now, she's a really good senator. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, name means a lot. So Renee, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't know anything you want to talk about that we didn't cover? You know, we covered a lot. Yes. you've done this before <laughs> yeah so this is only Renee's second time a podcast I was like this is amazing like I, I can't believe this is only your second time I've got doing to do a podcast. I need to find podcasts yeah <laughs> they're a lot of fun yeah so so Renee can you give people your social media so people reach out to you um yeah I'm on uh, LinkedIn uh Renee R-E-N-E-E -E, Radcliffe R-A-D-C-L-I-F-F -F, Sinclair S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and tvw.org is where you can find all of the content uh, that TVW produces in a gavel-to-gavel -gavel way or in our produced shows. And um, you can also find TVW on uh, those uh, social media outlets as well as Instagram. And to listen, we have the link to our social media in the show notes. You can find our show notes at www.cavernishtlblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the Jason Cabin Experience. So, so Renee, uh, social media, do you find there's a certain social media that like best for TVW or how do you pick that? There's so many, like, it seems like it's a new social media platform every day. How do you, um, you know, we talked a little bit before about there's so many ways to push your information out these days and you just have to keep evaluating it every day. Uh, TVW has been successful on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, especially our, our educational programs on Instagram. Um, but we're, we're evaluating that stuff every day. Um, cool. So, um, Renee, you have any investment advice or anything you want to talk about? You know, um, I, it's hard to run for public office, but I encourage people, if you really have an interest in policy and moving your communities forward in positive ways, to look at it. And uh, I'm always happy to talk with anybody about what it takes to run. I've just given you all my social media connections. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk about that. If you really want to make a difference in your community, step up and do it. Renee, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.